or in Firefox. But the code is being hosted in a web server somewhere at Google or YouTube or Facebook or Baidu, right? Then here we did the same thing. We broke up the process into two when the computation was happening in one place and we were seeing the results in another. And what that gave us was a system where now we could run the code, run the same code as before, but also get the figures back out. And in addition, we developed it to run in the web browser. So I'm showing you this that looks like slides, but in reality, what I have here is my web browser. So I'm actually running this in my web browser. And this little bit right here is not a screenshot of my code. I didn't paste code in here. I actually have code in here, and I can run it, and I can change. This is a plot of vessel functions, and I can say I want to plot them instead Instead of between 10 and 30, I will plot them between 1 and 20, and it will rerun the code. So this is actually executing code, and I'm getting the results out, and I can also type text, and I can also have mathematics in there. So this is text, and if I edit it, you see that I can type LaTeX equations, Right, I can type, so now I have something where the same idea of running code that I had before can happen, but it's happening in the web browser, and it's communicating with a process that does the computation, and I have not only my code, but the results of my code, and the text about my code, which means I can run it locally, or I can run it on a server, or I can run it on the cloud, and I can do my own coding and my own exploration and I can do my publications, and I can teach you, like I am teaching you today, all of it with one single environment. It's not as slick as what Andreas uses for his slides, but it gets the job done. So what we did over time is to really embrace the web as the environment where we do computing. And so we said, well, now that we're in a web browser, what can a web browser display? They can display images. Okay, if I compute something which has image data, when I return the value of that computation, I'm going to display the image. Instead of printing a message that says, this is image data, I will simply show you the image. If I load data which has video data, right, I will display the actual video. And this is actually the embedded the embedded video of, in this case, a little bit of, a, of an equation like the one that, uh, like, uh, like the weight equation that Andreas was talking about. This is the result of a, of a simulation of, of, the, of, a, of a short simulation of a wave propagation. So the idea is, let's embrace the web and let's grab anything that comes back from a computation and display it as the result and display those results in the web browser and allow our codes to return anything that we can put in the browser so that we can teach with kind of all of the technologies that the internet allows. So imagine that you have, to show another example, some audio data. So I've, I've made a small recording of audio, and audio data is data in time. You can plot the time series of the data. You can also take the Fourier transform of the data and display the spectral structure of that data, or you could display the audio itself. How much work will the chunk chunk if it was chunk on chunk chunk? So in here you have the same exact data source and you have three different ways of looking at it. And this is actually with Python code that computes, that plots the time series, that computes the Fourier transform, and that generates the embedded audio object. So if you're teaching signal processing, you can combine all three of them, and we're still in the same environment that runs the same code as before. We also have mathematics. So if your objects return mathematical expressions, you can display them symbolically. And this is very useful because in Python, we have a symbolic library called SymPy. So for example, in here, if I say, show me 
the equation x plus y to the power 2 times x plus 1 and expand that equation, I can show you those results nicely displayed mathematically. And if you run them again, so again, this is, the reason why this is nice is because, oops, the reason why this is nice is because seeing equations rendered like this is a lot nicer and cleaner than seeing equations just in, in text format, right? So this is a case where I just changed the exponent from 2 to 20, and you see the equation computed and displayed um, play immediately. So I've shown you how to do interactive code, where I type code, and the code gives me results, and I get the answers back. But there's another form of interactive code, which is to have graphical interfaces. Not interaction where I type code, but interaction where I have, say, buttons and menus and whatnot. That can be very useful. The problem is that writing that kind of code, writing code to have a graphical interface, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So when we're doing scientific work, when you're analyzing data, we tend not to write graphical interfaces because it's time consuming. Writing a graphical interface takes time and effort. And so what we've tried to do with IPython is help you have graphical user interfaces, the acronym GUI in English stands for graphical user interface between buttons and menus and things like that, so that you can have graphical controls for your problems, but with as little code as possible, and not to design a big complicated application, because there's already good tools for that, but graphical interfaces to explore just the problem you're working on. So imagine, imagine that you have the following problem. I'm going to run code here. I have two images that I want to compare. You want to compare two images. You want to know what changed in two images. In this case, these are actually the logos of a university in England that where I was visiting two weeks ago. And they have an old logo and they have a new logo. And you'd like to know what has changed between these two images. You'd like to compare those images. There's many ways you could compare two images. You could compare images by computing the difference between them. You could compare images by blending one image into the other. You could compare them by showing the right and the left part of either. There's many ways you could compare images. And you can imagine writing a couple of functions, simple functions to compare your images. And here's an example of comparing them by simply drawing, showing at one point part of one and part of the other. So here, 80% of the image is the old one and 20% is the new one. So if I want to change this and I say, show me half and half, I have to rerun it again here. OK, this is half and half. If I want to see only 10% of the first one and 90% of the other one, I can show this. But it's kind of annoying to have to go and type every time I want to see this, type a number here, right? Wouldn't it be nice if I had a slider that said, well, drag a slider and show me the one image and the other so I can compare it. So this bit of code right here is all you need to be able to get exactly that. If you write that little bit of code, and instead of calling the compare function, you say, I want to interact with the compare function, then, and I want my two images A and B to be fixed, and I want actually more than one way of comparing. I want to be able to compare it with different ways of comparing it. Now, you have something that lets you drag the slider, and in this case, you get that vertical shade and every time you drag the slider it's actually calling the comparison function and returning a new value. You can say, oh, I don't want to look at, I want to compare these images instead with a horizontal slider. <laughs> so now you have a horizontal slider. I want to compare them by blending the two images. So this is 50% of one and 50% of the other. If you drag it here, you get all of the first image. If you drag it over here, begins blending into the other until you have 80% of the first, 80% uh, of the second, and in this case you get all of the second. 
So the point is, this gives you something that makes it easy to explore, in this case, what changed between two images, and look at the amount of code that it took. That's the entire code that you have to write. You have your compare function, and you simply say, A and B are fixed. This alpha argument goes from 0 to 1. And then the methods are blend, difference, vertical shade, or horizontal shade. That's it. And then once you have this, we automatically create this control and this control and give you the output. So the idea is, not only do we let you interact with your code by typing code, we also make it possible to interact by creating little graphical interfaces, but with very little code, simple enough that you will do it while you're working on a problem. And now you have your little interface, you explore things, and you can move on. This can be used. This can be used to interact with anything you want. So this is a classical example of three differential equations, not like the ones Andreas was talking about over there that are partial differential equations. These are ordinary differential equations. The dots mean derivatives with respect to time. So this is the time derivative of x, y, and z with respect to time. So you have three variables, x, y, and z. And this system of differential equations is called the Lorentz equations. Who has heard that term before? Some of you have. So these are equations that were studied in 1963. And Lawrence, who was at the time a professor at MIT, discovered that this system of equations had a very funny behavior, where very small changes in the input produced very large changes in behavior in the output. Have, has any of you heard the term chaos? Have you heard about chaos? So, Chaos is a term that is used in the popular literature to refer to that phenomenon of very small changes in the input producing big changes in the output. And this was the first system where people realized that, that was happening in 1963. And a lot of theory has been developed since. And so we can study how that system behaves by solving it. And if I solve it once, then this is the kind of picture that I get. These are many trajectories of that system. But it's useful to be able to explore where what happens as I change, for example, beta or R, what happens to the system. And so similarly, if I call this same interact right here, I can get a slider that lets me change the structure of these equations. And as I drag my sliders, I can see how the behavior of the system changes as the parameters of the equations change without writing any more code than that. So this is all the code I wrote. I had my solver, which uses some of these Python libraries like the ones um, Andreas was talking about. And all I have to do is say, I want to interact with it, and I want to vary these parameters, and you automatically get these controls. So that little bit of code lets you play with these, um, with these tools. I won't go into the technical details of how that works. Um, one final example to show you the kinds of things Back to the notion, back to the idea that we're really trying to use the web for everything. This is a little graphical control to show how integers are factorized, to explain the factorization of numbers. What does it do? Simply, I choose a number, and when I click Calculate, it'll factorize it into all of its factors. But what it's giving me here is an object which is a graph using a JavaScript library called D3. And JavaScript is a library that builds objects called graphs, among other things, um, using an algorithm to display them called a graph force directed layout algorithm. And it lets me display this graph. And so when I do the factorization, I get, I get my result. And I have 6 is factored into 2 and 3. If I, if I change this number to 10, to 10, I will get 5 and 2. Now, a number like tw 12 that has more factors right, breaks down into more factors. What happens if I put a number that has lots of factors, like say 72, that I know has a lot of factors? They keep coming. 
But the point is this remains alive. So here, what's happening is I have code in the browser that's running and continues to update while code that's factorizing in the back is sending data. So new data is arriving here and the code in the web browser continues to update while new data is coming from the back end. In this case, what's coming from the back end, and now it's finished, what's coming from the back end is something very simple, factorizing a number, but you could imagine that this is a complicated computation happening in a server. It's one of Andreas's complex calculations running in a parallel cluster, and it's still updating and interacting in the browser as the data arrives. So all of these tools, all, this is all of what IPython enables. It lets you interact not only by running code in a terminal, but by running code also in a browser, by running code that can produce results that are displayed statically, like that figure that I showed at the beginning where I just got a plot, or images, or audio, or video, or even live interaction where you get live con graphical controls and two-way communication. And all of that is what the I in IPython stands for. It's interaction with code and computation in a very broad sense. IPython is all open source. And what has happened is over the years, a big ecosystem of things has grown around IPython. And it's an ecosystem whose purpose is really computing and understanding, as I said, understanding scientific problems, not just doing Python. I love Python, Andreas loves Python, it's a great language, we use it a lot, but, but at the end of the day we're scientists and we're trying to understand scientific questions, and we may need to use other languages. So IPython lets you use other languages as well. For example, R, who here has heard of the language R? Okay, several of you have heard of R, you have, some of you have statistical backgrounds. R, for those of you who don't know, it's a very good language for statistics. And so Python can do statistics, but R is much more widely used than statistics. So if in, if in Python, in IPython, I say double percent R, what I'm telling IPython is stop. The next chunk of code is not Python, it's R. Run it in R and give me the answers back so that I can use R while I was working in Python. So this block of code now will, it doesn't matter what it does. This is doing a very simple, a very simple linear model of x as a function of, uh, of y as a function of x. This syntax is the syntax in which you express things in R. You're computing the coefficients of the fit. You're printing the summary, and you're plotting the results of that fit. And here, IPython will actually, for those of you who know R, you will recognize that this is what the summary looks like, and this is what the plot of the linear fit in R looks like, okay? There's another really interesting language out there called Julia that is sort of similar to MATLAB. Those of you, when Andreas asked you, I saw that many of you have used MATLAB. Julia is a, is a language in the spirit of MATLAB, but much newer, coming out of some colleagues at MIT who are rethinking how to do numerical computing today and are coming up with some really interesting ideas and in Python, with IPython, we can do the same thing. I can continue working with my Python data, but here I have a block of Julia. And interestingly, Julia, because it's a very new language, didn't have as many plotting libraries as Python did. So what the Julia people did was say, ah, in Julia, we're going to be, reuse the Python libraries. We're going to let Julia call Python code. So now we're in Python. We're going to start Julia, and then we're going to let Julia call back into Python when it needs to. So here, I'm doing a simple computation of S sine of 3t plus 4 times cosine of 2t. It's just a function. And then I'm going to plot that with matplotlib, which is a Python library. So inside of the Julia code, I compute some mathematical expressions, and I plot them back using the Python plotting libraries so that I can use both. I can also use Fortran. Who here has used Fortran ever? <laughs> Probably none of you, because Fortran is now a language that is mostly used only really in high-performance computing. So physicists, some applied mathematicians, computational chemists, uh, climate modeling people use Fortran, nobody else. But it's a very good language for purely numerical computing. It provides very high performance. So in here, if I say Fortran, then this block of code can be in Fortran, and I can still use it 
like I would use a Python script, the Python scripting language. So for example, in here, I'm calling that plot, but I can change what I compute in Fortran. And then when I plot it, my function changes. So I can have my Fortran code, and uh, Fortran is a language that has to be compiled. So what is happening is I Python is actually calling Fortran and calling the Fortran compiler and bringing that code back so that I can use it as part of a Python plotting call, as if it was yet another scripting language. So we're building these tools that let us talk to all of these programming languages, that let us do visualization, that let us do interaction, and we're creating these documents that I'm showing you called notebooks. Well, as I said, in addition to computation, we want to communicate, we want to publish, we want to put blogs out, papers, books. So we're, what we have done in IPython is build a set of tools called nvconvert that let us exchange these documents, transform them, take these notebook documents and turn them into web pages, into PDF presentations, into papers, etc. And we make it very easy for, you, for people to share their work. So what we did was we created a service called NB Viewer that makes it really easy to share work in this format. So if I make one of these notebooks like this presentation and I want you to be able to see it, if I email you that file, then you're going to have a very weird file. That file is not a file that you can open in Microsoft Word or it's not a file that you can open in Firefox or Chrome or anything unless you have all of the iPython tools installed. And I don't want that problem. I want to be able to share my work with you and have it how do you easily see it? Of course, I could take my notebook and convert it to PDF and mail you a PDF, but that takes more work. So what we did was we created a service called NB Viewer that lets you put where your notebook is, anywhere online, you can put the URL of a notebook, and then we automatically convert it for you into a web page that your colleagues can see. So in here, NB Viewer has many, many notebooks. And so if I click on one of these, this is what happens. <laughs> okay, well, it doesn't matter. I had another one. Um, I, had, I had one open already in advance. So this is an example of what, you, of what happens. You have, you see a web page. So this is a web page that has NB Viewer, and then the URL of the original notebook. In this case, this is a notebook from Peter Nor written by Peter Norvig, one of the directors of research at Google in California, who wrote a notebook about a comic called XKCD that presented a problem in text analysis and in programming called regular expressions. Who, who knows what a regular expression is? Some of you do, some of you don't. 